I want to start off by asking Bernard about the basic premise for this novel. It is Thomas Hookton going in search of St. Peter's lost sword. This sword that will give the man who possesses it world domination in effect. But it's also a cursed sword. There's a wonderful kind of double edge, literally and metaphorically, to the possession of this sword. Because even when Thomas Hookton gets it, what actually is he going to do with it? Um, but the first and most obvious question, which you have to ask any historical novelist, is what truth is there behind the story? Oh, no, I'm, I'm a fiction writer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish. I, the problem is I wrote a trilogy about Thomas of Hookton, which he looks for the Holy Grail. And, and then once you've found the Holy Grail, what do you do? And I thought, well, I could start the new book by saying he'd mislaid it. <laughs> <laughs> We're left with three chronicles who do tell us quite a lot. Um, but it's quite nice, actually, to sort of make it out. I mean, that's the nice thing about fiction, because if you get something wrong, you just say, it's a poetic license. I, it's fiction, dear. It's fiction. I made it up. <laughs> but I think the story of the Battle of 1356 is fairly... It's, 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 it's as accurate as it can be in relationship to the chroniclers that we have. The big, the big argument is where the battle was actually fought. I had to make a decision, and I made a decision. And some historians would disagree with that, and others would agree with it. You speculate in a very interesting way, I think, both in the book and in your historical note, about whether the Black Prince, who has his walls of reputation, ever actually wanted to fight. No, he didn't want to fight. Um, they get there. They, they get to this hilltop on Fatia, at the Fatia on the Saturday, and by this time, the French, the French outnumbered them about two to one, and the, the English army is in pretty poor condition. They've been travelling a lot. And their biggest problem is thirst. There's no water on this hilltop. There is a river not far away, but the river is at the bottom of a steep hill. And they've got 6,000 men. And that means they've probably got 20,000 horses, because the army was always mounted, even the archers were mounted. Every knight would have a minimum of three horses. He would have servants and squires. They would have horses. We're talking about something like 20,000 horses. They were so short of water, they gave the horses wine to drink. Otherwise, the horses wouldn't die. So you've got drunken horses, um, which is a nice thought, uh, and tired men. And the prince fairly obviously thought, I want to get the hell out of it, because they spent the Sunday. The Sunday was a truce of God. And it was spent with, with uh, a couple of cardinals trying to negotiate a way out of this impasse. And what they eventually came up with virtually amounted to an English surrender. I can't remember all the details of it, they're in the book. Um, but the prince would be allowed to leave. He would have to give up hostages. The English would have to surrender all the land they'd taken in the previous ten years. They would have to pay an enormous indemnity to the French for all the damage they had done on the Chevrochets. It really was the most ignominious surrender, and the prince accepted. He said, OK. This is our way out. We'll accept these terms. Meanwhile, the French king, King Jean, he wasn't too sure he wanted to fight because he was scared to death of the English. But uh, he's surrounded by these guys who are saying, oh, we can beat them. He, as a French, we can beat them. This is easy. No, no. They are willing to take those terms. We can beat the hell out of them. And eventually, he is persuaded to fight. Um, now, on the morning of the battle, it takes place on Monday. The, prin the prince is obviously trying to escape. And he sends his left wing under the Earl of Warwick across the river. And the idea is to, 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 to steal a march on the French and, and try and get back to English-held Gascony in front of them. It has failed for two or three weeks, the French have outmarched them, but he still thinks he has a chance to get away. <coughs> and he does. It all goes wrong. Um, and, and almost certainly his, his escape route across the fort is blocked because there's a traffic accident, something like that. And he's stuck there, and the French attack. And by the end of the day, the prince, who has been willing to accept these ignominious surrender terms, has not only won the battle, but he's taken the French king captive. And this is this extraordinary battle where you have two sides, and both fairly reluctant, at least the French king is reluctant to fight, the French want to fight, I think. And of course the French have their Scottish allies. They're on their side. And it's the Scots who give him the advice that this is how you beat the English. And 
hell did they get beat to? <coughs> Sam would love this book. Anyway, um, but I mean, you know, there's this extraordinary thing that on the Sunday, the prince is really ready to surrender. And he's willing to take these utterly ignominious terms. And 24 hours later, he has the French king captive. Uh, he's lost about 200 men. He's killed about 2,500 Frenchmen. He's got about two or three hundred noble French prisoners. He's just made a fortune in ransoms. Um, so it is an extraordinary tournament. But in the end, what this battle comes down to is hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And it, it does at Utrecht's time, too. There are very few missile weapons in Saxon England against the Vikings. I mean, you can throw your axe, you can throw spears. But these things are not incredibly powerful, and a shield will stop it. Um, you end up three or four feet away from your enemy. Now, nobody is, this, by, by 1356, and certainly by 1415 in Agincourt, you're fighting in plate armor. You've got 60 or 70 pounds of plate armor, if you can afford it. You can't be damaged by a sword. The sword is, you might as well tickle with a feather. So what you're going to do when the French king in this battle fights with a lead-weighted battle axe, because a lead-weighted battle axe will hammer its way through plate armor. So you've got guys fighting with maces and falcon beaks, and it's horrible. Imagine Martin Johnson, you know, six foot six inches tall, encased in steel plate, hating you, carrying a lead-weighted axe, coming to kill you. <coughs> if you've got any sense, you're going to run. Get the hell out of there, fast. And the key weapon, of course, as Ben has already mentioned, is this extraordinary uh, longbow, English used, but... European domination for many centuries, and, and there's some wonderful descriptions about how it's used, and I think that the whole action of weapons fascinates you, Bernard. It must do, mustn't it? The, the, the business where you have to have incredibly strong shoulders. So Thomas, being in it, he's, he's been knighted, but he's come up a bit like Sharp, I suppose you'd say, from the wrong uh, side of town, and he's become a knight, but he was a foot soldier, and he's got an incredibly powerful shoulders, and you you describe how these arrows are fired by these pretty much deformed human beings, which you would have had to have beaten, I think. There are, by the way, women in this book as well. <laughs> <laughs> and they're great, too. The English longbow has a pull weight of, of about 125 pounds upwards. Now, a modern competition bow at the Olympics is 40 pounds. And if you get a 40 pound bow, you try and pull that. You know, it's, it takes a lot of effort. Try pulling a, a bow of 120 pounds. I mean, I'm not weak. I can open pickle jars for my wife. <laughs> Which is more or less the only use you are as a husband after the first few years. And, you know, I mean, I tried to pull a 120 pound bow. And the tension is terrifying. As you feel the strength of that bow when you try and pull it back. And these guys are pulling it back to their ear. And they're shooting 15 arrows a minute. I know that because there's a guy at Warwick Castle who's trained himself to do it, and we put up a Frenchman-sized target at 150 paces, <laughs> and he shot 17 arrows in a minute, and 12 went through the target, and the rest would have hit the guy next to him. Uh, this is terrifying. I mean, this is an arrow that will go through an inch of oak, but will it go through plate armor? The answer is probably no, because obviously there's always a race. There's a race between the offensive weapon and the defensive. You're very good at creating these feisty characters. I mean, Thomas's wife, Genevieve, is a very tough customer, isn't she? She, she has her eye taken out by this, this wicked hawk who uh, we won't mention what happens to him because we go too far ahead on the plot. But the hawk uh, takes out Thomas's wife's eye, and it's no matter. You know, she, next minute she's dabbing away at it, you know, that, that's fine, we'll, we'll move on. And I think that that, that kind of that tough can do woman. Is, is, is very prevalent, really, isn't it? In, in oh, no, I, say, no I, I, I tend to write strong women. Um, you know, you write what you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I counted three or four really nasty customers, but my favourite was Cardinal Bessier, who's, uh, I, so I discovered, not knowing it, but I, in, in Bernard's historical note, fictional, but he reminds me of quite a few cardinals in history. Is that, is that a coincidence? Oh, I, I imagine so. I am <laughs> constant. I, I really... If you're terrible, so here I am in St. Swithin's Church, and the Reverend Simon is so nice to introduce us. I'm constantly being asked on my website, why are you so nasty to Christians? Um, which I always want to ask. 
obviously you haven't even seen me start on the Muslims. But um, the point about, about medieval Christianity, this goes all the way back to, to Alfred, and certainly is true all the way through the Tudor period, is that if you are a very clever working class boy, and this is male chauvinist as girls who didn't get a look in. If you are a very clever working class boy, the son of a blacksmith, you have very little hope of rising through the ranks and becoming the Earl of, or the Duke of, or being very rich, unless you join the church. And so you have these people like Cardinal Wolsey, um, Cardinal, Cardinal in, in this book, which is probably related to the Talleyrand of, of Napoleon's time. These are ruthless men, utterly ruthless men, who are going to pursue power by the only way they know how. And the only way they know how is to join the church, because the church will give them advancement up a hierarchy. So you have this horrible situation where Christianity, which is supposedly a religion of love, etc., 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 becomes, in fact, an organization to provide ruthless, ambitious bastards with a way to, to, to get on. And I mean, one of my favorites is Arnold Dunbury, who was the papal legate when, when there was the crusade against the Cathars. This is before, this is sort of the 13th century. And uh, Simon de Montfort, not our Simon de Montfort, his father or uncle or grandfather, I have no idea, was leading the French forces in this sort of campaign against the Cathar heretics, which was declared a, uh, a crusade by the Pope. And they are killing everybody. I mean, they're just killing and killing and killing. They take a town and they would just put everybody to the sword, burn them at the stake. I mean, it's just horrible. And in the end, Simon de Montfort gets rather worried about this. And he says to, to Arnold Overy, who was the papal legate, he says, look, some of these people are good Christians. We shouldn't be killing everybody. I mean, we're just doing the wrong thing. And the papal legate looks at him pitilessly and he says, kill them all, God will know the difference. <laughs> and I love these characters. <laughs> <laughs> I adore them. Remember the Dominicans, you know, the Dominicanes, the hounds of God. They did all the torture for the church. Now nowadays, you know, you can't actually imagine the Reverend Simon actually having a torturer here for people who didn't go to church. You'd probably have a much bigger congregation if you did. <laughs> so I suggest it, you know, I mean, you know, free suggestion. But I mean, the medieval church didn't believe in torture. Um, the only thing was you weren't allowed to draw blood, so they developed all these instruments that hurt you horribly without drawing blood. Uh, I think it was Martin Amos who said that, that um, your best years really are gone by the time you get to your late 40s and 50s, 60s and onwards are down all the way and it seems to be the opposite with you and it must be slightly galling for some of your younger competitors to realise that this force of nature is still going strong and still producing uh, as good uh, books as he's ever done and I just wonder why that was, is that partly because you started relatively late? I mean, is no, it... I started at 35, which is sort of normal. Normal, yes. So why is it? Um, I saw some of Robert Hughes wrote. I mean, I, 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 I think this is my 50th book, um, and I just started the 51st. And I'm worried. I, I, can I do it? Um, and I think that's a very good place to start with a book, is to say, I'm not sure I can do this. I'm not sure I can write a book. And there was something that Robert Hughes said. He, I, I liked it so much, and I think I'm going to stop saying that Robert Hughes said it. And claim I said it. Um, which is that self confidence is the gift given to the less talented. <laughs> oh, wow, that was immodest. <laughs> uh, do, you have, uh, do you have any favourite uh, contemporary authors? Do I have any favourite contemporary authors? Yes. <laughs> Want 
volunteered. Nobody came along and put a gun to my head and said, you will be a writer. No, 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 please don't. No, you'll be a writer. I'm going to shoot you. All right? So there is this, this job that so many people want to do, which we love doing. And then you're going to say, I can't do it. Now, think about this. Imagine <laughs> that you are a nurse. In, in, I don't know, what, what is the biggest hospital in the world? What is it? Well, that one. And you're a nurse at that one, okay? And you phone up one morning and you say, Oh, I'm sorry, I can't come to work today because I've got nurses blocked. <laughs> and they say to you, Oh, my dear, stay home until you feel better. Right? And do you think she can get away with it or he can get away with it? This is rubbish. <laughs> it's rubbish. Nurses do a far more valuable job than I will ever do. Ever. And if they're not allowed to have block, I'm not allowed to have block. Now, there are two exceptions to this rule. <laughs> the first is alcohol. <laughs> have a drink at lunchtime, you can't write in the afternoon. I know some writers write better, but for me, no. You, you, cannot, you, know, you cannot drink a lot. Uh, so I don't. And the second one is if you are writing your first book or second book, when you will be assailed by self-doubt. And you will think, I'm wasting my time. What you have to tell yourself is that everybody began there. Joanna Rowling began there. C.S. Forrester began there. Shakespeare began there. Saul David began there. Everybody starts from that first square on the board and thinks, I can't do it. So no, there is no such thing as writer's block. It is self-indulgent garbage. <laughs> Done. Rip. End of story. Uh, Any characters I found really difficult to kill off? Yes. Okay. Um, what happened was I wrote the first Sharp series, right? Sharp Seagull, Sharp Skull, Sharp Skull, blah, 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 blah. Right? And then along comes Shaw, and you have to write a second series, which is dovetailed in. Right? It's not really dovetailed, it's bodging carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and it means that all the girls in the second series cannot stay in his life because they're not in the first series. And I think my favourite heroine is Lady Grace in Sharp's Trafalgar. I mean, she's a stuck-up icy bitch, but she comes through, all right? And I love Lady Grace. I mean, if, Lady, if I'd written Lady Grace into the first series, she'd still be alive. Uh, but she had to go. And it's terribly sad. You know? And there are other people I love killing off. I think in Sharp's Gold, I wrote about this apple cheat 13-year-old midshipman. You know, he's frightfully keen, he's really good. He's, he's, he's bright young yeah, man. And, and I took his head off with a gun. <laughs> Some bit half the column said, You can't do that, I really like it. So in every sharp book after that, you get the same 12, 13 year old, right, who comes on mustard key. And you know this little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally wrote Sharp's Trafalgar, Trafal which I like. And there's N. Snow, he's, he's midshipman, I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah. Thank you, midshipman. Oh, yeah. and, and I always give Judy the books to read before, you know. And she reads chapter two and she says, I can't stand it because I know he's going to die. <laughs> um, in fact, the poor little bastard has been shot to pieces. And I thought, I'm going to prove you wrong. So I went and rewrote that chapter and let him live. And he's still alive. I'm going to get him in the end. I am going to get him. He appears in another book. And this kid is surviving despite everything. It's all because of my wife. But one day I'll write a book in which he dies really nicely. <laughs>